All right. Well, hello, everyone. And again, I'm so glad to see so many people here at our meeting. It's been really just wonderful having this all come together. Um, I'm talking about uh, what I know best because I'm a faculty person. And a lot of times when people are building institutions, they'll come up with a site, they'll get funding, they'll put in buildings and curriculum. But really, the faculty are that sort of core of the institution. So I just thought I'd talk a little bit about how that particularly looks for our little college, Pomona College, and some of the aspects of that. Um, so my title uh, is based both on my work at Pomona and also from uh, my work at the Yale NUS College where I was working last year on my AC fellowship, where um, like many of the Indian institutions represented here, an entirely new institution was created based on liberal arts principles. So it's sort of a mix of old and new. And most of you in India, a place with 5,000 or more years of tradition, would not consider a 125-year-old college old. But in Southern California, that's considered old. Uh, there are traditions there, uh, some form of uh, academic culture, if you will, uh, aspects of uh, the mix of social capital, culture, tradition, were put uh, in kind of a nice way, I think, by uh, one of our former Pomona College professors and famous author, David Foster Wallace. Uh, he gave a famous uh, 2005 graduation speech. And in, the, in it, he gave a story of, um, as he puts it, there are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning, boys, how's the water? <clears throat> and the two fish swim for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and says, what the heck is water? And Wallace describes the meaning of this story as the most obvious, ubiquitous, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. And these are the aspects of the faculty scholar life that I really think need to be paid attention to. That invisible water that we swim in, that mix of values, of culture, of assumptions. And those in new institutions have to be consciously created. Um, now, what little I know about Indian cooking, uh, I learned from my wife, who's Bengali. She tried to teach me how to make a curry. Now, you can write it down in a recipe, and I think institution building is like this as well. You can have a recipe, but as anyone who's tried to cook knows, the recipe won't do it. You have to have heat, you have to add the spices carefully in a sequence, and then only then mixing the ingredients together to create that mix of seasoning and ingredients. I think it's like that for institutions. You bring in faculty, you bring in students, they are those ingredients, they're mixed in with that sauce, what one of the CMC deans called the special sauce of the institution. Maybe we'll call it a masala here or a sambar. Uh, and that sauce is what really determines the success and ultimate value of your institution. And that sauce is made of a mix of values, of culture, and academic mission. And as all of you are creating or recreating institutions, I urge you to think about how to create that mix of culture by consciously engineering faculty development opportunities. At Pomona, we have a new faculty workshop that's been really effective in bringing in faculty, teaching them about the institution, uh, forming a cohort. Other interesting ways of bringing faculty out of their departments, too, can be helpful. And uh, again, just to draw a little bit on the Indian uh, location here, I learned the term yesterday of Panchayati Raj, which is in the Constitution, the idea of the government by villages. And I think for many academic institutions, departments act something like that. They're villages, and they rule with an iron fist. Uh, in order to make the faculty scholar more effective in teaching and scholarship, they have to be pulled out of that village occasionally. And so initiatives that can bring together different institutions, such as this CMC Pomona event, uh, other sort of consortial arrangements, Pomona and Claremont Colleges have ample opportunities for faculty development, for incentive grants, for technology in the classroom, for in interdisciplinary curriculum development. These things really add a lot to our sense of the life of the mind and to our entrepreneurial enterprise. Um, the last bit I wanted to just talk about is research. And we talked some yesterday about how to balance research and teaching. This is an impossible task. And much as we saw in the dance performance, what seemed to be impossible ta tasks as well in terms of balance and posturing, the faculty member is always being pulled and pushed by forces for research, teaching, scholarship, students, family, 
other obligations, somehow all of that has to be balanced at a liberal arts college. In our case at Pomona, all, almost all of our faculty are research active, and we receive funding from national foundations. But we're not in it solely just to push our publications, solely just to get our citation index up. We try to seek out opportunities that can add to that social capital of the institution, and most importantly, provide opportunities for our students. So these things can also be facilitated by consortia. And in the US, the Claremont Colleges are part of several consortia. One is a Keck Geology Consortium that allows geology professors to work together, amplifying their power, in a sense. They're little colleges, but as a group, they can have sort of a collective mass that allows them to compete with the best departments in the country. Our little astronomy department works closely with Harvey Mudd College, and we've also partnered with nearby Carnegie Observatories. And that's enabled us to send students to Chile, to go to Caltech, uh, building instruments, to do all kinds of amazing things that we wouldn't be able to do in isolation. So I would say for all of us in little colleges, having that consortial type opportunity really adds a lot to our life and our ability to accomplish that research. So I guess that's all I have time for. I'll stop here so we'll have a little bit of time for questions for both of us, Shivy and I. I have a question for Brian. I loved your reference to Indian cooking and the sauce and, you know, uh, and I would just like to say that they also say that uh, the food tastes better when it's cooked with love. <laughs> and so, you know, to continue thinking about how do you get faculty moving yeah. in, a, in a place. I was just wondering, we also talked yesterday about liberal arts being about democratization of spaces, right? Yeah. So given that we cannot do away with hierarchy completely, I would just like to hear from you about initiatives about democratizing the space for faculty and for students uh, so that yeah. they cook with love. Well, um, that's a great point, and I like the idea about love. It reminds me, too, of the uh, dance performance where the fellow was saying there's a science in their posture, but the art is in their smile. And I kind of think there is that mix in institutions as well. Democratization comes naturally in a small place, and that's the advantage of a village-based type government. In a little college, the departments are all very close-knit, very tight-knit. So the faculty do work very much on a, a peer basis. If you're talking, too, about the students being democratized and, and feeling empowered, liberal arts is perfect for that because they have full control over their academic program. They choose their major, their courses. They have more choice than some of them know what to do with. In fact, um, we try to channel that choice a little bit make them more intelligent at choosing, and empower them to make those choices based on new skills, quantitative reasoning, critical thinking, uh, advanced uh, skills in all types of disciplines. So I think the democratization of liberal arts goes hand in hand. And when I, when I was thinking liberal arts, I think of it in terms of being able to liberate students. They're able to be able to break out of their past and redefine their future based on their own talents and interests. And so that is such a wonderful model. Our own daughter is at Carleton College, a school I admire much, and, uh, um, and, and I'm just watching her go through that process right now. She's enjoying that exploration, and then out of that exploration comes, I think, a more informed choice of where to go, so that your ultimate destination, your ultimate career is based on those talents and more refined identity that you're able to form. So that's all, again, part of democratization. Anyway, long answer. You were describing how Yale University and, of course, other places in the U.S. have also opened up and broadened their disciplinary departmental bases and all that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would have loved to, I want to hear if you have anything to say now, again, as more of a scholar or someone observing those processes, not as an insider building them up. Um, whether you don't think that the pace of slow is extremely slow, unradical, non-transformative. I mean, in most places, there is still total and indifference and marginalization of, quote unquote, the rest of the world and all the significant developments, no matter how they are termed and named. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess that's a matter of perspective. Uh, 
how pessimistic a view we take of the current situation. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, it was somewhat, probably did have the flavor of a report from the trenches. And when you're in the trenches, you'd like to believe you're winning. Uh, otherwise, you might spend the rest of your life in the trenches. Uh, so, uh, but I do believe that uh, some of this rethinking is happening. And that's why I alluded to, uh, as I said, some of the bastions, because one of the things I learned over the last five years is to think, uh, to learn that some of the hardest places to bring this change to bear was the departments where I thought I'd face the least problem, right? Like history of art. I thought they would know about world art and care about it enough. So, uh, uh, so and political science was an immediate friend. I mean, uh, and I thought that will be where I'll fight a lot of battles with all these game theorists and experimental econ economics types who believe there's no fieldwork needed anymore. But uh, it was a contrary experience. So I think as we do the work, we realize the resistance has come in the unexpected places. But then when you overcome them, it is a movement forward. Uh, and uh, right now I'm thinking so uh, we, it's still possible to have, as I said, a department of religions which ignores nine out of 10 of the major world religions, but that's also changing. And I think uh, on the whole, I would be a little less optimistic, a, a little less pessimistic. But as far as what is the character of the change, I think that remains under discussion. And uh, how people view these uh, shifts and these reorganizations of disciplines remains under discussion. And the most important thing is universities and colleges undergoing such changes must maintain those active discussions about how they're changing, what they're changing, to what end, and, and so forth. And as long as that discussion is open and the changes are not just brought about because somebody decided that's good for you, uh, I think that's much better. And the process is therefore, to me, as important as, as the goal towards which we're working.